안녕하세요. My name is John Hoffman, and today I'm going to talk about how we've scaled Foursquare server-side infrastructure over the past five years. So who here is familiar with Foursquare? OK, great. A good number of hands. And who here has used Foursquare recently? A lot less hands. So we've changed things around recently, and I'll talk a little bit about what Foursquare is. So Foursquare is primarily a recommendation engine. And you use it to find a place to eat or a bar to go out in, either in the city you live, like here in Seoul, or maybe when you're out traveling. We also have another application called Swarm, and that's the application that you would use for keeping up and meeting up with your friends. You use it to check in to share what place you're at with your friends and see where your friends are at. We're headquartered in New York City, and uh, this is what New York City may have looked like just a few years ago when it was primarily a trade and finance hub. But in recent years, a lot of tech companies have been starting up there, and we're one of them. I'm going to break this talk into two parts. And in part one, I'm going to talk about how we've scaled our data storage. Just got a little bit louder in here. And in part two, I'm going to talk about how we scaled our code base and tooling to manage complexity within the application. So in part one, I'm going to go back to 2009 when Foursquare started. And we started out, as a lot of companies do, running on top of MySQL. But very shortly after, we switched to Postgres because it happened to work better with the application libraries that we were using. And we did a lot of the standard things that people do. So we started off with all the tables that powered Foursquare, all the user data in one single server. As load increased, we just bought bigger servers. And that worked for a while. As load increased a little bit more, we added a caching layer on top of that to handle some of the frequent queries. And then we said, hey, you know what? We're going to split some of the data that we have from one server into multiple servers. And for the queries that, we're do that we were doing as SQL joins, well, we just do two separate queries and join that data up in memory. We also added some read-only slaves so that we could spread out the read load appropriately. In 2010 is when Foursquare really got onto a kind of hockey stick growth curve. And our data started to grow exponentially, especially our check-ins data. We went from getting a few thousand check-ins per day to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands and then to millions. And it was clear that in a short time, we just have too much data to fit onto a single server due to memory and disk I.O. constraints. And we'd have to split that data up across multiple servers. Splitting up a single type of data across multiple servers is very commonly referred to as sharding. And that's something that a lot of people know a lot about today. But five years ago, my team didn't know a lot about it. Um, but we did know that it was something that we could handle ourselves within Postgres and build our own tooling. But we also knew that there were a lot of complications around that. So if you split your data up into two servers, what happens when you add a third and now you need to rebalance your data? What happens if the distribution strategy you chose to split up your data produces unbalanced shards and then you need to rebalance it? And that kind of accounting work is pretty complicated to do without taking downtime in a live system. So we decided that we'd look at some alternatives that purported to do that for us. And there were a few major ones at the time. But Mongo was really attractive to us for a few reasons. One, it had a feature that we really liked. It had this geo-indexing feature that was interesting to us as a geo company. Uh, two, it also had the ability to add indexes on other pieces of data within the data that you're storing besides just the primary key. So it was more than just a simple key value store. And three, we knew the co-founders of Mongo. They were fellow New York startup people. And we knew that if we ran into problems, they could personally help us. So we decided to take a gamble on Mongo, even though at the time they didn't have a fully baked sharding feature, with the hopes that by the time it was fully baked and we really needed it, um, they'd be ready for us. <clears throat> 
So it took a while, and there were a few hiccups along the way, but within a year and a half, we had all of our data migrated from Postgres and onto Mongo. And today, Mongo is the system of record for all of our user data. We run about 15 separate Mongo clusters, and we have 600 replicas running within those clusters. And at peak, we do over a million queries per second within Mongo. Mongo has been a great general purpose storage engine, but there's some situations where it's not quite the best fit. And one of those situations is for key value data that we generate in a nightly, in a nightly batch. And an example of that data is scoring inputs for places that we use to rank the results of a recommendation query. Another situation is where we have read-only data that originates in Mongo, but we want to query it at very low latencies and very high rates. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about how these things work. So for the read-only key value store, we call that thing the H-file service. And Foursquare stores a copy of all of its data and all of our logging data on the Hadoop file system. Uh, developers can run MapReduce jobs to process that data and generate these things called H-files. And what an H-file is, is just a file format that can store key value data where the prefix of the file is an efficient index from the key to the dislocation of the value that you're trying to look up. So we have these MapReduce jobs that generate H-files. Those H-files are stored within the Hadoop file system. And then we have these server processes called H-file servers, and they start up, they load those H-files from the Hadoop file system and into the memory of their processes, and then they expose that data over the network for our application servers to use. We use a tool called Zookeeper, which is an open source tool to do all of the coordination about which files live where. And Zookeeper is a tool that I'll mention a few more times it's become the indispensable glue that binds all the things together at Foursquare. And it's very commonly used as a tool to build distributed applications on top of. The caching services are what we use to take data that originates in Mongo and make it available at very low latencies to our applications. And the way this works is it takes advantage of a feature that's built into Mongo for replication. Mongo stores all of the updates, all the write operations that you do to it inside this append-only log called the operation log. And that's what it uses itself for replication. We take advantage of that operation log and tail it, and every write operation that comes in to a collection that we're interested in, we will take and store into a Kafka queuing system. We then have an application server pulling that Kafka queue, and it'll take that data, transform it, and store it in an appropriate data structure within the Redis cache. And then we also expose an interface to querying that data within that service so that our applications can query the data in a specialized way. Both of the systems that I've just mentioned have a common theme. And that's that when they are under a lot of load, they insulate Mongo from performance problems. And when Mongo is under a lot of load, it's insulated from, uh, it ins the, these two systems are insulated from performance problems. The trade-off for this isolation is that we just have a lot more moving parts and there's more complexity within our application. So that brings me to part two of this presentation or I'll talk about application complexity. And again, I'll go back to the year 2009 when Foursquare was just getting started. The original Foursquare prototype was created by Dennis Crowley, who is the co-founder and CEO of Foursquare. And Dennis is a really, really smart guy, but one thing that he was not was a software developer. And it's actually very impressive that he was able to create this prototype. He wrote it in PHP. And if you looked at the code, you would see that it was kind of like a jumbled mess of business logic and database queries and rendering all in you know, giant files. There are no models, there are no views, there are no controllers. There was no organizing principle 
for the layout of this project. And as Foursquare uh, got funded later in that year, they hired their first server engineer, and he decided to rewrite the application in Scala so that it would be more maintainable going forward. And Scala is a programming language that runs on top of the Java virtual machine. So things were going well. We continued to add more features, but we realized that we needed some tooling to make things easier to, to understand whenever we had problems. And one of the first things that we built was an RPC tracing tool. And what this does is, given a web request or an API request, it allows us to see all of the database queries associated with that one request. Very often when there's a performance problem for, let's say, the home page of your application, that's caused by a database query that's taking a long time and you want to know what this is. So this allows us to see exactly what's going on. And you can see in the screenshot they're exposing things like what thread a query originated on, how many milliseconds it took, what exactly it was, and where in the code it originated from so we could track it down and maybe tune it. Another tool that we built was the ability to dynamically switch code paths on or off while an application was running. And we call this system throttles. And what it, what it does is it allows a developer in a very small amount of code to wrap some piece of functionality that just says, hey, if this switch is on, do X, otherwise do Y. And then we could switch that thing on dynamically through a web interface and we could say, hey, always turn this thing on, never turn this thing on, turn this thing on for only these users or maybe for only a percentage of users or maybe for only a consistent hash percentage of users. And this has been really indispensable for us. We use it for things like feature rollouts where we only want, you know, let's say 5% of users to see a feature or we launch something new and we're not sure how much load it'll place on the system so we launch it very slowly. So development on the code base went pretty smoothly for a long time, but as we added more and more functionality to a single code base, we started to have a monolith on our hands. And we ran into monolithic, uh, monolithic problems. So one problem that we had was that while Scala is a great programming language, it's also extremely hard to compile. And if you have a single code base, for every change that you make, you're compiling all the code all the time. And that ended up being many minutes of lost productivity for our developers. We were also having to deploy all of the code all the time. And because there was so much code churn, that meant that there was very, a very high probability of there being a bug whenever we deployed new code into production. And that was really annoying because if there was a bug in feature X, but there was no bug in feature Y, we still had to roll back an entire release, even though X did not affect Y. And that was frustrating for the developers of feature Y. Another problem that we had is that whenever there was a performance issue, especially when it had to do with resource leaks, it was very hard to track down exactly what the cause of the problem was because so much was going on within the binary at the same time. It was hard to discern cause from effect. So we knew that we had to break things up a lot into separate components, into a services-oriented architecture. It's usually just referred to as SOA. And the way we did that at first is along very coarse lines. So we took all the functionality related to our API and said, okay, that's gonna be an app. And all the functionality for a website, that's gonna be a separate app. And then everything else, that's gonna be a separate binary as well. We also took smaller distinct pieces of functionality out of our app and created these small little microservices. And we built these on top of a Scala RPC framework called Finagle that was produced by Twitter. And that allowed us to very easily create these services based on thrift interface DDLs that we defined. Now, these little microservices had a lot of benefits. They addressed those monolithic problems that I talked about before. So they were very quick to compile. They gave us uh, fine-grade control over our releases. We could do very quick releases. We didn't have to roll an entire 
you know, an entire feature back if one of these little microservices failed. And also, they're very easy to de debug performance problems because they had a very limited set of functionality within them. But they were also very easy to create, and that created another problem. There was sort of a Cambrian explosion of these little microservices. And what we were worried we would end up with is a lot of problems because we didn't have the right tooling in place. So one of the problems was that every developer was inventing their own way of deploying their code into production. Another problem was that that RPC tracing that we built, that didn't work across application boundaries. So it was hard to figure out what was going on when we had problems. Another issue that we had was that we were basically hard coding host names into configuration files, the host names of where those services lived, and that made it very hard to move things around. Another issue that we had is that we were taking functionality that used to be in process and we're moving it onto the network, and networks are unreliable, they can fail, they could time out, and we didn't have a good way of dealing with those problems. So we did a lot of things to address each of those issues. First of all, we created a way to define a service using a single configuration file, and based on convention, we would auto-generate all of the tooling necessary to deploy that service. Another thing that we did is we made sure that the framework that people were building things upon was exposing health checks and monitoring data in, a, in the same way, so that it was very easy to build dashboards. We took that RPC tracing framework that I talked about before, and we made it work across application boundaries. So we built a distributed tracing framework in-house. We created a way to aggregate all of the errors across all of our applications into a single application so we could get one view of all of the errors that our app was seeing. To address the problem of hard-coded host names in our configuration file, we took advantage of Zookeeper and we did application discovery on top of Zookeeper. So when an application started up, it published itself into Zookeeper and then we were able to look that up via consistent name in our applications. To address the problem of these services running on the network, we created some tooling that allowed us to fast fail an RPC call whenever we thought there would be a high probability of failure. And the system's called circuit breakers. An example of what I mean is, let's say 80 of the past 100 requests took longer than two seconds. Well, we know in that case that there's no point making our users wait for that RPC call to complete. We might as well just fail fast. So given these tunable heuristics, we could say, hey, you know what, fail fast and only um, try some small percentage of requests, and if things improve, then go back to the service and turn the circuit, break, uh, turn the circuit back on. And we force the developer to decide what to do in the case of failure. So the developer can say, hey, you know what, if this service is failing, you know, we can't continue and we're just gonna bubble up an error to the user. But maybe there's other things where we could fail gracefully. So if a service is failing, maybe it's not in the critical path and we could just return some default value to the, to the user. So to give you a recap of each of the problems that we had and how we addressed them, to address the issue of all of these different um, custom tooling, we consolidated that effort. We created a single configuration file for doing all of our deployment. To address the issue of dealing with execution problems, we created some consistency around monitoring. We created this distributed, uh, this distributed tracing framework, and we aggregated all of our errors into one spot. To deal with the problem of hard-coded host names in our config files, we started doing application discovery within Zookeeper. And to deal with the fact that networks are unreliable, we created this circuit breaking framework. So to change tack a little bit, 
about a year ago was when we split the check-in functionality out of Foursquare into this separate application called Swarm. And that also presented some organizational changing, changes within Foursquare. So we created a small team that was vertically integrated. It was a mix of server engineers, iOS and Android engineers. And they were just kind of at the stage where they were exploring what to do, and they wanted to be able to iterate on things very quickly. And one of the ways that we iterate on things is we create these new public API endpoints and we expose over the public internet, and then the Android and iOS developers can build features on top of those things. And we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if a developer could expose a new API endpoint on the public internet without deploying our still monolithic API server? And we created the system that we call remote endpoints. And what it allows us to do is, in a relatively short snippet of code, a developer can say, hey, here's some URL patterns that I want to respond to, and then they can define the way that they want to respond. And just by running this code on their own development server, they will have created a service that's exposed on Foursquare's public API, and then the iOS and Android engineers can iterate on top of that service really quickly. And you know what, if we didn't like that feature, they could just throw out the code. It wasn't like a deployment headache for anybody. We didn't have to get any operations people involved or anything like that. And the way that this works is actually really simple. So when the developer starts up this code that they wrote, just by virtue of starting it, it, it uh, defines, um, it creates a record inside of a Zookeeper routing table that says where it lives. And we have this dedicated process called an API router that takes in all the API, all of the HTTP requests. And when an HTTP request comes in, the first thing we do is we look up the URL pattern inside of this routing table. And if it matches, then we know that we have a service that can handle it. So we do a little bit of authentication and authorization, and then we pass the request along to the service, we get a result, and that's what we return to the user. So this has been really great for our developers. It's one of the things that we built at Foursquare that had the, the fastest adoption. We have a relatively small engineering team too, but still, but there are many things that we developed over the years that you know, were slowly adopted. And this is something that you know, within a few days after sending out an email about, we had something like you know, five or 10 of these little services that people were playing with. So it was a really great success for our infrastructure team at the time. It also gave us a clear path towards breaking out functionality from our existing API into smaller chunks. And that's something that we're still doing today. So that's actually all I have. Uh, thank you very much. And now I'll take questions. Okay. Uh, gentleman is there. Totoke. Ah. Uh, uh. Uh, hello, like, I'm Yan Jung-Yu from Yonsei University here. <laughs> and like, thank you for your lecture. Um, I have a one question that like, I, I remember you told, uh, you used Thrift with MongoDB for like, yeah, like send some data. But as far as I know, Thrift is kind of like not the distributed system, which means like, I thought, using Thrift and MongoDB might be the bottleneck to use the distributed system. So the, my question is that, um, did you have any problems because the Thrift, the Thrift server, which, which is the middle layer, was, was bottle, kind of like bottlenecked? And if you have the problems, then how did you solve it? Ah, uh, OK. So Thrift, we were just using Thrift as a definition language. We were not using the built-in Thrift server 
that ships with the, uh, the thrift libraries. So that was not a bottleneck for us. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. I don't know where you are, actually, so go ahead. Oh, there you are. <laughs> 저기 아까 뒤쪽에 질문 네. 아, 네, 가게 잘 들었습니다. 예, 네, 그 제가 그 포스케어를 갖다가 거의 한 3년 정도 계속 이용을 한 열혈 유저 중에 한 명이었었는데요. 아, 그 포스케어를 는말 그대로 체크인과 거의 동일칠 정도로 굉장히 좀 파급력이 강하고 중독성이 있는 어플이라고 생각을 했습니다. 아, 그런데 그 굳이 그 수험이라는 어플을 새로 만들어 가지고 포스케어와 분리를 한 이유가 혹시 있는지 그리고 그 분리한 이후에 사용자들의 반응이 어땠는지 좀 궁금합니다. 그렇습니다. And in that way, we could focus more on recommendations. There's also kind of a, a fundamental difference in the way that you want an application to work when it's focused on recommendations versus when it's focused on check-ins. So for a check-in application, that's a very personal thing to be sharing your location. And you want to have a very curated small set of people that you're interacting with, like just your close friends in your friend graph. For recommendations, you might want to get recommendations from people who you aren't necessarily friends with, but you just trust the opinions of. And so by separating the two applications, that allows us to have separate friend graphs. In Swarm, we have a very tight uh, binary relationship. And in Foursquare, we have a follow graph. So for the reasons that, one, we think that there's a larger user base for recommendations, and two, that there's just kind of this disparity in the way that you want friend graphs to work for these two different types of use cases. That's why we separated things out. Now, how's the reception been? Initially, there were a lot of people who were passionate users like you, and they, they didn't understand why, they, why we did this. And I think part of the problem was that we launched Swarm before we launched the new version of Foursquare, and it just like, wasn't clear what was going on. Like, the, the rationale behind it wasn't well explained. And I think now we're doing a, a better job of getting the word out there, but perhaps not well enough. It's, it's very hard to, to get our message out because um, we need to re-engage a lot of users like yourself. And I'm probably not the most qualified person to do this. I'm just a software engineer. But right now, we're thinking about ways to do that. We're responding to feedback that we get from our users via our community and also via the app reviews that we get in the various app stores. And I hope we're doing a better job. I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. Yeah, I'm a force care user. And I really, uh, I really uh, surprised that you are checking technology. Uh, can you compare your checking te technology API versus the Bluetooth uh, beacons check-in technology. I think uh, these days, many applications use uh, Bluetooth uh, beacon mm -hmm. for their check-in. But I cannot see any advantage of uh, using Bluetooth beacon uh, if I compare that to your check-in technology. Sure. How do you think about that? Yeah. So. A big problem that we have, and I think this was discussed during uh, the Shopkit keynote earlier today, is that GPS just like, really isn't that accurate, right? Uh, the best case is it might be accurate within 10 meters, but in a very 
dense city like Seoul, you know, 10 meters could be like three different places. So how do we know exactly where you are? When you want to check in at a place, we want the first result to be the place that you're actually at. And we've used a lot of different statistical models to try to do the best we can at giving you a good result. But we really are, are guessing. We've gotten better and better at it over the years, but it's still a bit of a guess, and we're not right 100% of the time, just a large percentage. But it, it would be really great if we did have things like iBeacons installed in businesses, because that would give us just way more confidence that you're actually at a place. The problem right now is that it's not yet widely deployed. You know, not all the phone hardware supports it. Um, the costs haven't gone down so that enough so that it's feasible for us to send these things out to all the businesses all over the world. But I think as time goes on, the costs go down and these things are deployed widely. It's something that we will take advantage of. Um, and it'll prove the situation that's already pretty good, but it'll, it'll just give us you know, higher confidence that we're giving you the right result. Well, it depends on the, how much accuracy uh, the user wants, I think. Hmm? Well, it depends on the, how much accurate information uh, the, the users needs or not. Well, whether, whether to use the well, GPS or beacon or like that. Um, right. So right now, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so in Forceware, one nice thing about Foursquare is that you actually don't need to open the app to get use out of it. Just by having the app installed on your phone, we can, via the background, detect when you're in a new place. And using the same kind of search that we use to, to guess where you are when you check in, we can determine with a high confidence whether you're at a place, whether you've been sitting there for a certain number of minutes. And based on that, we'll send you a push notification that's a tip for something to do at that venue. Like, hey, we see you're at, you know, Jen's Noodle Place. Try the uh, soba noodles. They're delicious. Something like that. Um, but that's, that's pretty accurate right now. If we had iBeacons, we could really, you know, make a, a much better feature that was, you know, accurate a much higher percentage of the time. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't know how to do it. 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 I don't know how to 모니터링 대시보드는 몽고디비나 다른 모든 인프라 스트럭처 모니터링하는 걸 직접 다 새로 만드신 건지 뭐 그런 게 궁금합니다. 오케이, okay, so I think the question is re is regarding our um, RPC distributed tracing framework. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so that was actually developed in house. And there is a open source tool that you can use to get distributed tracing. It's called Zipkin, and it's produced by the Twitter people. And it works very well if you happen to be using Finagle, which is actually the RPC framework that we use. So I'd recommend looking at that. I think it might be, um, you might be able to leverage it in other situations, even if, that, even if you're not using the Finagle RPC framework. For monitoring, again, that's something that we built in-house, um, and it's not super great. It's, it's basically just um, a, a bit of JavaScript on top of Graphite, which is a, um, a metric storage engine. Now, a trend, if you've listened to this talk and you're hearing my answers, is that we're reinventing a lot of things that many other startups have, have done. And like each of these things could be a business. So if you're uh, you know, a software engineer and you want to start a company, like all the tools that we developed are tools that every startup ends up building once they get to a certain size. And they end up reinventing the wheel every time. So a really strong package or an open source package or a company to support those things I, I think is in, in great need right now.
질문 더 있으세요? 아까 이 질문 괜찮으세요? Okay, I have a question. Well, uh, well, you, you, one of the approaches for the monolithic problem uh, was, uh, well, move, well, move from large teams or smaller teams from front end to back end. Mm -hmm. Include, yeah. How? Uh, what would be the advantage and disadvantage of that approach? I mean, inside of size of the teams or some efficiency of the work, like a, a all 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 the uh, well individuals would be uh, would be in, in 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 each in each team, like a developer, uh, publisher, uh, well, info engineer, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it just goes like back to. Um, there's, there's trade-offs in the design of any organization, right? So an advantage of having, you know, let's say all of your iPhone development being its own team responsible for all the features is that you have a lot of communication between those iPhone developers. They could build libraries to support each other. They all know what each other is doing and they're working on the same code base. A disadvantage is that they might not have as good communication with the server engineers who are building the back end for the same feature. Um, and so we decided when we split up these apps that it was, that we wanted to optimize for the communication of the server and the client engineers rather than maybe the, the quality um, and the communication of, of the iPhone engineers. And it's something that we, you know, we did fairly recently and seemed to work out. I don't know, at some point we may go back in the, in the other direction. I think it's something that a lot of companies change, you know, the structure of their teams as they, they have new work to do and as you know, the world changes around them. So you are seeing the advantage of that uh, approach uh, rather than uh, the other one? Yeah, for now we're seeing an advantage in having these vertically integrated teams. Okay. Um, that might change at some point in the future. I see. Thanks. Sure.